Professor of Stochastic Analysis. He is a full professor of uh, Stochastic Analysis uh, at the University of Luxembourg. And uh, also he is, I believe, current president of Luxembourg Mathematical Society. So I, I check uh, Giovanni's uh, CV and uh, I know that his supervisor was Mark Yor, but I didn't know that he started uh, as uh, his degree first in economics and then he switched to probability theory. And when he completed his PhD in, in Paris, University of Paris 6, uh, he had some full professor position in France and then he moved to Luxembourg where he is now for, I believe, for more than 10 years now. Giovanni was on editorial boards of uh, various uh, well-known journals in probability, for example, Bernoulli, Annals of Probability, Stochastic Processes and Their Applications. He published uh, four books and uh, more than 100 uh, papers in really top rank uh, journals. And uh, uh, I wouldn't like mention all his uh, uh, scientific uh, high achievements and research, but probably everybody knows about uh, post moment theorem, which is probably very humble now called some variation or similar, at least in this talk. So, this result is probably changed landscape of limit theorems, of course, at least uh, okay. during the last 40 or similar years. So, Giovanni, you are very welcome. We are very glad that you are given talk to us. Okay. So thank you very much for this kind introduction and for, for the invitation. I'm very happy to give this talk here. And so my talk is based, as you can see on, uh, I brought here a, a series of papers with uh, my friends, Christian Dubler and Mikolaj Kafzak. And, um, and so, and, and the main topic of the talk is uh, some collection of results, first in a finite dimensional, then in an infinite dimensional setting that uh, generalize and refine and expand a remarkable uh, paper uh, by the 90s, from the 90s, by a Dutch mathematician, uh, Peter de Jong, which is about the Gaussian fluctuations of uh, um, U statistics. So it's a very classical topic, very classical objects in probability theory. So linking to your presentation, um, the starting point of my, of my talk is the observation that in recent years, let's say the last 15 years, uh, there have been the proof uh, of several results that have the form of what we call fourth moment theorems. Now, fourth moment theorems are statements, roughly, that tell you that for sequences of random variable that typically live in the eigenspaces of Markov operators, like for instance, random variables within a Gaussian Wiener chaos, a Poisson Wiener chaos, and more recently in the chaos uh, spaces associated with diffusive Markov operators, then for a sequence of random variables living there, once the sequence is normalized, converges to Gaussian, that is the occurrence of the central limit theorem happens provided that the fourth moment of those random variables converges to the fourth moment of a target distribution, which is three, right? So these are my sort of remarkable results for several reasons. One reason being that they simplify a very popular method for establishing limit theorem, which is the method of moments and cumulants, which, for instance, is very popular in statistics. And in order to understand and to refine, and in particular to prove quantitative version of these results, uh, several techniques have, have been put into, into the arena. And one of them is, of course, Stein's method, and then the, the, an infinite dimensional version of variational calculus, which is known as the Malium in calculus. And then more recently, uh, semi-group uh, techniques that are related to Markov operators for this, this latest development. So, okay, so what, one fact about this fourth moment theorem, which is remarkable, is that not only they come with the statement that the fourth moment condition is sufficient and often necessary sufficient for a normal approximation, but also they come with sufficient and sometimes necessary sufficient condition of an analytical nature that are expressed in terms of analytical quantities like contraction operators. And whenever you have some therefore equivalent reformulation in terms of some analytical quantities, uh, you gain a lot of flexibility. And indeed, this kind of results have been applied to a number of, uh, in a number of, uh, of, uh, of situations like mathematical statistics, mathematical physics. Stochastic geometry is maybe the field where 
the most remarkable application to be developed recently and also computer sciences, etc. Okay, so now uh, the, 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 the motivation for my talk, the initial motivation for my talk is to put forward the fact that this line of research uh, was anticipated actually by several years uh, in a paper from the 90s, from 1990 by Peter de Jong. And so as I was anticipating this paper uh, is, is concerned with the fluctuation of your statistics, but not only your statistics, but a specific kind, which is like degenerate your statistics. Now, in order to, uh, uh, to understand what I'm going to tell you, in order to, to state properly uh, the result by de Jong, let me, let me give you uh, a, a couple of slides where I introduce my notation for the rest of the paper. So this is a very classical notation about your statistics, and I will just, uh, uh, just, uh, just put it forward in order to, to be clear in my, in my talk. Uh, so the situation will be the following. So I will consider for an integer n, a sample of independent, not necessarily identically distributed for the moment random elements that take values in a measurable space, E, E calligraphic, and uh, uh, which is generic for the moment. Uh, and now for, for a given integer uh, k from one and n, I call square integral use statistic of order k, a random variable w that has the following form, which is obtained as follows. So you take the sum over all subsets of size k, exactly of size k of the integers one n, and then for each of those subsets, you consider a function g, which is square integrable, and in principle might depend on the choice of the indices, which is computed on the subsample xi1, xik, right? And then you take the sum over all, uh, all elements of this stuff. So I'm taking the function to be square integrable because I need it, I need to work in that framework, but the definition makes sense for a generic function gi1, ik. Okay, so this is a generic definition of a use statistic. And uh, uh, what sometimes uh, pops up in application is the notion of a symmetric use statistics. And so a symmetric use statistic W is obtained from the previous framework by considering random variable XIs that are not only independent, but also identically distributed. And by assuming that the function G I1 IK does not depend on the choice of I1 IK. And then that the function G therefore is also symmetric. So it is symmetric and, and also not depending on the choice of the indices I1, IK. So one particularly crucial notion in probability theory and stochastic analysis is the notion of a degenerate U statistic. So a degenerate U statistic, which is, might be non-symmetric, uh, is a U statistic such that the kernels G, I1, IK that are represented in this, in this formula uh, verify the following de degeneracy condition, that is for every choice of I1, IK, uh, taking the conditional expectation of G of XI1, XIK, conditionally to any strict subset of the sample XI1, XIK, so I take a, a subset A, which is a strict subset of I1, IK, gives zero, right? So you have a conditional expectation with respect to any strict subset of this type is equal to zero. Okay, so as you can imagine, the generative statistics, the degeneracy conditions yields several forms of decorrelation between the component, I mean, yield decorrelation between the components of the U statistics and simplifies the combinatorial analysis in several ways. Now, what happens, the generous U statistics are going to be uh, the main object of the Young statement and of many of my statements. And, uh, but these are not only interesting mathematical objects, they are also fundamental blocks of more general objects. And this is the, uh, the um, uh, this is the content of a, of a famous result, which is known as of Oefting decomposition that was, was put forward at the end of the 40s by, by Oefting. And this is a result that tells you that if you consider any square integrable functional capital F of the sample X1, Xn, then this random variable can be uniquely decomposed into a sum of degenerate U statistics of all the K from zero to N. I identify U statistics of all the zero with the constants, right? And basically, so this is a unique, this decomposition is unique and uh, proving it is quite simple. It's just an application of the inclusion exclusion principle, but nonetheless, this is a very powerful result. And it was applied to my knowledge for the first time by Höfting at the end of the forties in order to prove a central limit theorem for non-degenerate Q statistics. So it was really in the spirit of what I'm going to tell you right now. Now, uh, uh, one, let's say remarkable and uh, also ubiquitous example of a degenerate statistics. So once again, degenerate statistics are basic building blocks. So considering them, 
might give you access to fluctuations more general object because of 15 decompositions. Now, one specific example of non-symmetric and degenerative statistics that appears in several places of stochastic analysis is given by homogeneous sums. So homogeneous sums are obtained by considering a vector x1, xn of real valued and centered random variables. And then by defining the random variable w that is obtained by taking for every subsample i1, ik, the product of some real constants depending on i1, ik, multiplied by the product of xi1, xik. So these are truly uh, everywhere. For instance, if you want to build double integrals, triple integrals with respect to Brownian motion, with respect to Poisson process, then the first thing, I mean, the right way to go is first defining multiple integrals with respect to simple integrals. And in that case, the multiple integral is exactly an homogeneous sum of this type. And then you go to the limit. And so this, this, this are improving eta formula, for instance, for, uh, for polynomial transformations of Brownian motion, you can go to the, you can make it in such a way that homogeneous sum appear like this one. So as I was saying, for real value generic random variables, uh, homogeneous sums are not representative, I mean, not exhaustive of, uh, of, of uh, degenerative statistics, but in the specific case of Rademacher variables, then all this concept that is on plus one minus one IID random variables, uh, then the concept of the degenerative statistic of order K coincides with that of an homogeneous sum of order K. And the collection of all homogeneous sum of all the k that are associated with uh, rather macro random variables uh, is often called the Kate Walsh chaos that plays some important role in, um, for instance, in analysis of Boolean functions, uh, function inequalities involved in Boolean functions. Now, as I was anticipating, we will be interested in showing and discussing Gaussian fluctuations, so central limit theorems in a multi dimensional and infinite dimensional setting that are associated with your statistics. And so I'm going to do that for most of my talk uh, in a framework which is close uh, to uh, the conditions that lead to the Lindbergh central limit theorem, because we have a sum of independent random variables and Gaussianity emerges as soon as a contribution of each single random variable vanishes at the limit uniformly, right? And so a way to capture this kind of phenomenon in the setting of your statistics, and here I'm focusing on degenerative statistics to introduce the notion of a maximal influence. So the maximal influence of a U statistic W that I take to be degenerate is the following. So you take the maximum for every I from one to N of a quantity that for a fixed I is obtained by taking the sum over all subsets of size K that contain I of the expectation of G I one I K X one I K to the power two, which is the variance of this quantity. So basically you take a degenerative statistic the variance of the U statistic by the degeneracy condition is the sum of these quantities. And then you isolate the quantities that contain the, the, uh, the variable I, and then you take the maximum. And each one of these quantities represent the influence of the variable number I. And of course, the maximum is what we call the maximal influence. And what we're going to do, we're going to study, and what the young did was to study limit theorems for uh, this infimum going to zero. So under the assumption that this infimum goes to zero. Okay, so this is the general notation. Uh, what I will tell in the middle part of my talk at a certain point, I will argue that uh, uh, a certain results will happen, a certain functional result will happen because, uh, because symmetric U statistics are uh, as some sort of a rigid structure that, uh, that basically makes some argument just purely of a combinatorial nature. So in order to have a glimpse of this rigid structure of, 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 uh, of symmetric new statistics, let me just put forward a, a couple of very simple computations. So for instance, if you have a degenerate and symmetric new statistic, W is a sum therefore of degenerate kernels of this type in such a way that G does not depend on the choice of I1, IK, then one can simply, of course, by orthogonality, one can simply compute the variance of W. The variance of W is simply the binomial coefficient n choose an n over k multiplied by the expectation of g squared right by orthogonality because there are exactly n over k uh, choices for subsets of size k of n and then one also by using this relation one can also quickly compute the, the influence actually the maximal influence which is just the influence of any any index i that is obtained by simply counting the number of k plus containing n that contain the index i, and these are exactly given by the binomial coefficient n minus one over k minus one. 
in such a way that the influence is given by this coefficient multiplying by the expectation of g square. And then you plug this computation into here, you find that the maximal influence, the symmetric case, is always equal to the variance sigma square multiplied by the ratio k over n. So in particular, if k is fixed and the variance is bounded, converging or equal to one, then the influence goes automatically to zero, right? So this is just an example of how computations are simplified um, in the case of a of a in the case of a of, of a symmetric statistic. Okay, so now uh, the Young theorem. So the Young theorem comes from the '90s, and uh, it uh, it is so it was published in the Journal of Multivariate Analysis. And in this paper, the Young considered a result for a sequence of normalized and degenerative statistics of a fixed order k. And the statement in the Young paper is the following: So if the influence, the maximal influence associated with Wn converges to zero, uh, then Wn verifies the central limit theorem uh, if, so provided that the fourth moment of Wn converges to the fourth moment of the target Gaussian distribution, which is of course equal to three. And this is the fourth moment theorem by the Young. So what is different, I mean, what is, what is uh, the, the, the influence condition that is here is not stated typically in fourth moment theorems of the new generations that one that, for instance, uh, uh, pertain random variables in a Gaussian mean a chaos. Uh, but it, but it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is of a of a fundamental importance here. So there are reasons that maybe I will evoke why it doesn't appear in later contributions. Okay, so this is the, the result, a starting result, which anticipated my many years what was done afterwards. Now, uh, the original proof. Of, uh, of, of the Young is based on, Mart on the classical Martingale central limit theorem. And also it involves quite a, let's say heavy, I would say, yeah, heavy combinatorial analysis. So the heaviness of this combinatorial analysis is it is very specific and, uh, uh, and it is related uh, really to, uh, to the condition, to the fourth moment condition. You can basically imagine what happens. You have a bunch of conditions from the Martingale limit theorem you would like to verify. And then you have this fourth moment condition. Now, since the U statistic is a sum, the fourth moment of a U statistic can be expanded in a, in a, into, a, into four sums, right, of expectations. And then the combinatorial analysis boils down into a classification of the summons in this fourth, in this four sums appearing in this in this huge sum. And then you have to classify them according to how the index are repeated, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, an important role, then you have to isolate uh, the, the parts of this quadruple sum that contribute to the limit and then prove that this convergence to three implies that the condition is the marking of limit theorems are, are verified. And, uh, and the influence simplifies the analysis because it kills several, several combinatorial terms. Okay, so this, this was the contribution by the young. And so in the, in, the, in the next part of my talk, I would like to advertise uh, a couple of results that are contained in a relatively old paper from six years ago that I wrote with Christian Dobler. And uh, with Christian, we wanted uh, to address two questions that are related to this theorem. So the first question is that, so can one obtain bounds? That is, can one measure the error in this Gaussian approximation, like some sort of various in bounds, in such a way that the bounds that we obtain uh, uh, display the quantities that are fundamental in the assumption, that is the influence and the discrepancy between the fourth moment of Wn and three. And then the second question was that, so what happens at a multidimensional level? That is, if instead of considering one single run uh, statistic, we consider a vector of U statistics. So do we obtain results that correspond to a, to a drastic simplification of the method of moments that it happens in one dimensional case? We wanted to do that because that happens in other, in other, in other, in other contexts, like the Gaussian minor chaos, Poisson minor chaos. So we want to check this at a U statistic level. So I will state now those results in a one-dimensional setting and a multi-dimensional setting. And then I will give you just a quick overview of the proof, um, um, a quick idea of the proof. And uh, I will tell you why I think that not only the content of the result, but the proof was some sort of a fruitful and, and interesting to, uh, to consider in, um, in the discussion. Okay. Uh, so the first, the first result is therefore one-dimensional result. It all comes from the same paper. So I wrote 2017, probably what, 2016. And it is the following. So we consider a normalized degenerate U statistic of all the K, not necessarily symmetric, not necessarily homogeneous sum. 
And we consider a target random variable, uh, n01, so an n01 target random variable. And then we, we want to measure the discrepancy between the distribution of W and the distribution of Z by using the one vastest and distance of which I recall the definition here. So the one vastest and distance between W and Z, the distributions of W and Z is the supremum over all one Lipschitz functions of the absolute value of the difference between the expectation of H of W and H of Z. Uh, so this, of course, if the vastest and distance between the distribution of two random variables converges to zero, then this implies convergence in distribution, but this is not the, the opposite implication is not true because convergence of the vastest and distance also implies convergence of expectations. And so this was quite, quite a strong metric that implies, implies a number of phenomena. So what we proved is that uh, the vastest of one distance between W and Z is bounded by some universal constant. And then the square root of the discrepancy between the fourth moment of W and three in absolute value plus a combinatorial term, which is very, very bad and suboptimal, and then the square root of the maximal influence. So this, was, this is a satisfying bound because the two quantities that appear in, an, in the Young theorem come up in a very clear way. And this is a not a satisfying bound because the natural question of what is the dependence on K of, K on K of this bound. So can one also let the order of the U statistic go to infinity with N with the sample size so as a very uh, suboptimal answer because the combinatorial constants are actually uh, can be bounded from above, but in a way that makes it uh, not particularly interesting for applications. Okay, so this was our first, our first contribution. And the second contribution is in a multidimensional setting and finite, but multidimensional setting. And it answered the two questions of, is one able to prove quantitative results in a multidimensional setting and also what is the equivalent of the Young theorem in the multidimensional setting? And so the statement was the following. So we will consider a vector W1, WD of the generative statistics. And so, and for the sake of this very statement, I will take W to have the identity covariance matrix. And I'm going to compare the distribution of this vector with the distribution of a D dimensional Gaussian vector with the same covariance matrix in order to simplify the statement. And as a test function, in what we proved in 2017, we took a, a, a test function of class C2, and probably here I should put some uniform bounds on the derivatives that I did not put forward. Uh, and so at the bound we obtained, and I'm going to comment in a minute, has been generalized to the D vastest and this. So the vastest and this are RD uh, by Fang and Koike in a, in a recent paper from 2022. But however, our original result that also holds therefore in more demanding metrics like a vastest and metrics in multidimension tells you that if you consider the expectation of GW and GWZ in absolute value, then I put a square here in order to simplify the formula, then this is bounded by some universal combinatorial constant, which is very unsatisfying as before, multiplied by what? By the sum of the single discrepancies between the fourth moments and three in absolute value, and then the square of the maximal influence of each one of the, of the, of of the U statistics, and then a mixed term that corresponds to a mixed four moment, right? So you have the expectation of W two I square, W two K square minus one for every I different from K. So uh, it is indeed therefore. So this implies, of course, a, a convergence result, and this convergence result, even in a multidimensional setting, simplifies the matter of moments and cumulants, telling you that if you can prove if you have a vector, and if you can prove that fourth moments and influence functions verify. Uh, the assumptions component-wise of the Young theorem, then everything you have to do is to check this mixed fourth moment in order to obtain joint convergence to Gaussian. And actually one remarkable fact is that if you make the additional assumption that each of the use statistics come from have a different order, pairwise different orders, then you can actually remove this quantity. So you can have a, a result that tells you that everything is, in, so the, the, the joint Gaussian fluctuations are completely encoded in the, in the, in the, in the component-wise Gaussian fluctuations, and then in the normalization that makes this a, a vector with an identity covariance matrix, okay? Which is, which, is, which is quite a remarkable finding that reproduces equals results that happen on more general spaces or infinite dimensional spaces like the Gaussian linear case. Okay, so one word, some words about uh, the proof. So why do I think that uh, the, the one, some words about the proofs are interesting, uh, or should be said, it is because it, uh, um, 
it involves both the method and also the opening to further results. So what we used here, so in the original proof, as I was saying, the original proof of the young was done by using Martinger results. And what you're using here is the Steins method, and more precisely the Steins method for exchangeable pairs. And uh, so, and uh, so, in my limited experience in trying to do so, it is not very often the case that uh, uh, results that are connected with Martingale techniques can be reproduced by using uh, Stein's method techniques in a, in, a, in a simple way or in a straightforward way. Every time I attempt to do that, uh, things turn out not in, in the best of ways. But in this specific case, what is remarkable is that the combinatorial notions, the combinatorial results that are fundamental for proving the Young's theorem in uh, in the um, in a Martingale set in, with Martingale techniques are exactly the same that are used in a, with Stein's method techniques. So in such a way, there is a sort of parallel a need for the same combinatorial notions in both in both uh, in both uh, in both uh, ways of approaching the theorem. So as I was saying, so the method of proofs are based on the Stein's method of exchangeable pairs. So it is not my goal here to introduce to fully introduce uh, Stein's method. So sufficient to say the Stein's method is a collection of techniques of an analytical and probabilistic nature that allow one to compare the distribution of random elements and in particular real valued random variables by using differential operators. And the, the starting point of, of Stein's method is what one calls Stein's lemma, which is a very easy lemma that tells you that your random variable Z uh, as the N01 distribution, if and only if it verifies this exact integration by pass formula. So the expectation of Z F Z, uh, is equal to expectation of f prime of z uh, for every smooth function little f. And so and the idea of Stein's method is that one can measure the discrepancy between the random variable z and the generic random variable w by measuring how far is w from verifying this exact integration by pass formula. And so one idea that came up very early in the history of Stein's method is the idea that one can actually perform this program, that he has forced an integration by parts within the framework of a generic random variable by building what one calls an exchangeable pair. So very quickly, an exchangeable pair is a pair W, W prime uh, that is exchangeable. That is W and W prime has the same distribution of W prime W. And in the framework of Stein's method, one typically looks for an exchangeable pair that verifies a regression equation or a more general equations that are available, but in this case, I want to put forward is an exact regression equation that tells you that the expectation of W prime minus W is equal to minus lambda W. Now, you want to build W prime and W in such a way that they're close, uh, but not too close, because if W prime is equal to W, then this lambda is going to be zero, and then the bounds we're going to produce are going to explode. So there is some sort of competition between how close are W prime and W and the value of lambda, which is useful for your application. And then one classical example of application of this bound tells you that it, once you built a double, a, 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 an exchangeable pair with these features, then the vastness and one distance between W and Z can be bounded by the variance of the expectation of W prime minus W squared, conditionally to any random variable, capital, any sigma field capital G that contains the sigma field of sigma W in particular, sigma W, and then plus a residual term that is one over two lambda, the expectation of W minus W prime to the power three. And you see here exactly the competition between lambda and W prime and W. Okay, so this is the, this, this was method in our specific case, the exchangeable pair can be built for the value lambda equal to K over N, which is actually the maximal influence we computed before for a symmetric use statistics. Uh, can be chosen by producing a W prime that is obtained by extracting uniformly and it independently an index between one and then, and then by replacing, so the index is alpha, and then by replacing X alpha with X prime of alpha, where X prime is an independent copy of X, right? And then one goes on with the computation and obtains the bounds. And then in a multidimensional setting, we need still exchangeable pairs, but with a, a, a more general regression equation that also involves a risk. Now, uh, so the method was interesting, but also there is an important point that I would like to put forward is that, uh, so during the proof, uh, we had some sort of suboptimal uh, condition. So we had some quantitative version of a non-optimal, not, not, uh, not exact uh, statement of the Young theorem. And then at a certain point, my co-author Christian Dobler 
came up with an amazing identity I found at the time, and I still found very remarkable, that's related in a, in a, in a, in a very clear way. So the behavior of uh, this conditional expectation that appears in the, in the bound and the fourth moment of W, and then also the fourth moment of W minus W prime. So this is not an, an estimate, it is an exact relation. And uh, so at the time, so and this, this really like opened, uh, completed the proof that allowed us to have a full quantitative version of the Young theorem. So at the time, uh, we were also looking for fourth moment theorems for multiple integrals with respect to general Poisson measures, which seems to be like a different, I mean, it's not really different, but it is, it is, it has its, 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 its own challenges. At a certain point, so we took this formula and we tried to, uh, uh, to reproduce something like this formula on the Poisson space. And it actually worked out, worked out properly. And so this was also, this formula allowed one to, to prove the result uh, in a, um, also, let's say, inspired our results for the Poisson setting. But the fact that this formula can be reproduced on a Poisson setting is not just by chance, but it comes actually from some deeper characterization of the fact of the deeper uh, remark that uh, this quantity here that appears in the bound can actually uh, be given a functional analytic flavor. And this is actually what one called the square field operator. So it can be characterized as the square field operator or carré du champ operator, which is naturally attached to a semi-group, uh, which is, we can be built starting from this exchangeable pair condition. A square field operator were actually the key and then the right point of view in order to attack the problem on the Poisson space. And uh, so I would like to advertise therefore a paper by Christian from 2020, where this connection between exchangeable pairs and square field operator is put forward. So it's called normal approximation by a nonlinear exchangeable pairs. And, and really it put together, put forward the fact that all this computation, the use statistic setting, the Poisson setting, the Gaussian setting, can be unified by this notion, functional analytical notion of the square field operator. And we didn't know at the time we were doing that, but actually this is what we were doing in our proof. So we were just put forward the same quantity that later would have appeared uh, in a Poisson set. Okay, so I'm resuming this, uh, this remarks in, in a slide. So as I was telling you, therefore this proof was the blueprint for the proof of fourth moment theorems on the Poisson space. Uh, there is a remarkable paper in, uh, on the Poisson space by Dubler, Vidotto and Zeng, uh, that uses some infinitesimal version of Stein's method due to uh, Elizabeth Mecke. And also uh, probably the most advanced results are contained in a, in a new contribution, a novel contribution by Fang and Koike from 2022. And as I was telling you, the combinatorial component of all the proofs up to 2022, basically go back to Peter de Jong. And uh, we were pleased with, with, with uh, so de Jong, quit uh, mathematics just after the 90s. And, and he wrote us at a certain point, he said, I stumbled on your paper. And I'm very happy to see that every combinatorial computation that I did is still useful today, which is exactly the case. So it is, it is really the case. And then there is a paper where we refined some of the results in analytic direction with Christian uh, in 2018, where we used contractions operators. Okay, so very good. So this was uh, the first part of my presentation. Uh, which is finite dimension, so multidimensional by finite dimension. And what I would like to do now is to describe to you a collection of results that go in the functional direction. That is, to generalize the Young theorem in the direction of uh, of uh, functional fluctuation, invariance principle, convergence in the Scorogot space towards transformations of Brownian motion. Uh, so these results are of have a qualitative nature for the moment. So I would argue at the end that it is hope. I mean, we can hopefully have a bounds, and there are several advanced techniques that are have been put, in, put forward in the last, uh, in the last years, uh, 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 in particular by uh, Andrew Barbonat and Ross and, and uh, Guan Chu Zeng, uh, but we, we weren't able to apply them at the moment, so, but maybe something can be done. Um, okay, so let me move forward. So now what I would like to, to, to discuss is some uh, variation of the Young theorem uh, that is based on the notion of a, of a U process. Uh, maybe I should say sequential U process because this, uh, random functions, not random fields indexed by test functions, like the U process you find in some remarkable papers by Cornes, Telegram, and many other people. So these are really sequential U processes. And, and so and the situation is the following. So the framework is the following. So as before, I'm, I'm focusing on the symmetric case now, okay? So I'm building symmetric U processes. 
And towards the end of my talk, I will switch towards uh, non-symmetric processes, non-symmetric view processes. So the situation is the following. You have a sequence of IID random elements and before, and then for a fixed K bigger than two, I'm considering a sequence GN of symmetric and square integrable and degenerate kernels, right? So as before, but also there is a dependence on N. And so what I find to be the sequential U process associated with the kernel GN is a random function, which is indexed by zero one. So I'm going to denote it by UGNT. So GN is the dependence on the kernel and T is the dependence on the time parameter, which is obtained exactly in as follows. So I consider the exact definition of the U statistic as before, but instead of taking uh, the indices that uh, subsets of all the K belonging to the set one N, I'm considering the subset of all the K belonging to the set one integer part of NT for T going from one to two. So what I'm doing, I'm just revealing uh, with time. So by letting T slide from zero to one, I'm revealing the components of, uh, of my use statistics one by one. Okay, so some of those, some of this observation did not come before NT and therefore will not appear in the sum. And then slowly I will just uh, recover everything. And uh, uh, for T equal to one, of course, I have just the definition of my original, of my original use statistics. So uh, this, is a random function that lives in the space of Cadillac functionals on zero one, the score of space. And in my statements, I will write UN for the value of this random function at the point one, which is just the original U statistic. And I'm going to denote by sigma square of N, uh, the variance of UN. So the variance of this U statistic taken at the point one. Okay, so now <clears throat> what happens to this, these guys? And it, it, so the following statement takes place. So. I wrote executive summary because this statement is not to be found in the paper, but this is what the statements mean. Uh, so the statements are very technical, but this is really the, uh, the, uh, um, the let's say the content, the, the, the ultimate content of the papers. And so this is in a work of 2022 with Mikolai Kaspersky and, and Christian Dubler, and it tells you the following. So consider your sequential U process as defined in my previous slide, and normalize that with variance at one, right? Sigma n, I mean, the square root of the variance at one. And denote this by uh, u tilde, uh, u tilde, right? Uh, okay, so here, and this, of course, u tilde of n is just the, the, the random variable at one divided by sigma n. So, uh, first of all, we know that the influence, we know before, we are in the symmetric case. So we know that the influence, since we fix the order of your statistic is going to maximal influence is going to be the ratio K over N. We know already a priori that this influence is going to converge to zero because we are fixing K. And so the, the influence of the use statistic converges to zero. And now what we proved in our result is that if you have some control, I mean, some tight control on the rate of convergence of the fourth moment of, so the use statistic at the point one, right? Uh, so we are just considering the use of, I mean, the U process at for T equal to one and three. And if we know that this guy converges to zero at a speed, which is algebraic, that is something like one over N to the power eta for some eta that is bigger than zero, then automatically uh, we can conclude that the U process that was defined in the previous slide converges to a time change Brownian motion, that is to Brownian motion, which is time change by a monomial which is obtained by taking t to the power k, where k is the, is the order of the U statistic, right? And b, and b, <laughs> and b is a standard Brownian motion. So um, the, uh, this quantity, so this, this bound here, this orange condition, um, it is not expressed in this, in this way. I mean, not directly expressed in this way in the statement, but is rather expressed by using some analytical tools that are known are contraction operators that I'm not going to, to deal with in my, in my exposition. And we also have a, a multivariate version that is here. Okay, so uh, this condition here, that is this tight bound is mainly used in the proof in order to ensure uh, tightness. And uh, the, the way um, we prove tightness is by using this Kolmogorov-like Billing, condition proved by Billingsley that uh, so requires you to, to control some moments of the increments of your process. And then we use some specific uh, estimates for use statistics or bounds for moments of use statistics that are due to Ibrahimov. And then once the tightness is proved, 
Uh, the convergence of the finite dimensional distributions, that is what one has to prove in order to have functional convergence, completely emerge only from combinatorial considerations. Uh, that is, once you have established the tightness, then the convergence of uh, uh, the, so let's say, okay, so the, the convergence of uh, the covariances towards the covariance of this process emerge from combinatorial considerations that are related to the rigid structure of symmetric statistics. And then, however, uh, there is something interesting in the proof that is, in order to prove not only convergence of covariances, but actually central limit theorems for finite dimensional vectors of, uh, 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 let's say, of, uh, of random variables of the form UGN of T1, UGN of TD, one has to prove central limit theorems for vectors of symmetric statistics of different size. And this requires some, uh, some non-trivial combinatorial analysis that plays quite a role in the, in the proof. Okay, so this is, this is a, therefore a version, a functional version of, uh, of, uh, of the Young theorem in the symmetric case, the generate case that, uh, uh, that actually we don't know how to deal with in a quantitative way uh, for the moment. So this statement seems like some sort of an interesting one, but actually it happens that this statement can be used in all this, it's more general that than uh, some quite popular uh, invariance principle that is uh, due to uh, Miller and Sen. So I will tell you what the Miller and Sen result boils down to. And uh, so the Miller and Sen result actually contains the Donskap theorem. So this is what we have is actually a generalization of the Donskap theorem. So before telling you what the Miller and Sen result is, let me tell you how one can use this result. So actually the right way of using this result, I mean the most powerful way of using this result is to apply it to use statistics that are non-degenerate and to exploit in particular the multidimensional version of our result together with what I was describing in the beginning as the earth in decomposition. And so one way of applying the result is the following. So consider a normalized, uh, so consider U processes, UN on zero one that are centered and symmetric, but not necessarily degenerate. So UN of T, this pop up in several applications. So and the kernels are given by GN, right? And these kernels GN are not degenerate in principle. Now, by using the Hopkin decomposition that also holds at a, at a process level that I was telling you before, then this U process of order P can be actually decomposed in a sum of degenerate U processes that enter exactly the framework of the previous statement. Now, we have a multidimensional result. And uh, uh, here, and after considering some, uh, let's say, some uh, uh, taking into account some combinatorial complications that come from uh, this step in the decomposition, one can prove the, the following statement. So suppose now that the variance at one of each one of the components of this decomposition converges to some number, b squared k, positive number, and assume that each one of these u processes verifies is slightly modified to take into account these combinatorial com uh, complications of the assumptions of the theorem for the generative statistics I proved before, then one can prove that the U process UN converges to a linear combinations of independent Brownian motions that are time changed with a monomial to the power of the order of the U statistic UK multiplied by t to the power p minus k. And this t pi minus k comes from some combinatorial coefficient. And uh, where the big k are independent Brownian motions. So uh, this theorem therefore tells you that, gives you a general framework for proving the general class of processes towards which U processes converge. And in particular, in contains can be used to prove a theorem by uh, Miller and Sen that was proved in 72 that told you that now if you, your gn has the form one over the square root to n, or square root of n to the power two p minus one, multiplied by kernel g that does not depend on n, then this guy is going to converge in distribution under very minimal assumption towards a Brownian motion b, which is not time changed, multiplied by p minus one. Okay. And you can actually recover this result from our, from our findings. And of course, if you take p equal to one, then you recover the Donskap theorem, which is therefore can be seen as a, as, as a consequence, as an implicit consequence of what you have. Yeah. Okay, so now this result by Miller and Sen, 
uh, is uh, and actually our generalization of the results by Miller and Sun can have uh, can be used in order to uh, to to develop some interesting I think geometric applications and in particular can be used in order to have some functional result that involve u statistics that naturally appear in the counting in subgraph counting in a very popular and simple I mean the simplest model of a random geometric graph which is known in the Gilbert graph. So uh, let me let me describe to you what some examples of this type. So uh, let's consider the following situation. You take a sequence of numbers, positive numbers, converging to zero, and consider a, a sample x1, xn of iid uniform points like this one on the unit cube. And then the Gilbert graph is obtained as follows. So you connect two points that you see as the vertices of your graph. In this case, is for d equal to two, of course, whenever the distance is less than uh, the number rn. And then you let n go to infinity, so you augment the number of points, and you let rn go to zero in such a way that some edges are deleted, for instance, if two points are too far away. And so uh, one, what one is interested in is uh, to study, for instance, the U process, which is associated with the edge counting. Also, we can count many things, but here, edge counting. So let's say uh, we are, so we want to, to, for every t, we want to study the number of edges that involve indices i, j, that appeared before time integer part of nt, right? So, uh, so these are edges that are, so two points are connected. These are pairs ig such as the two points x, i, c, j. So this is a number of edges that involve points that came before time nt. So one typically works under this assumption that n squared and uh, r and d converges to infinity. So in such a way that you have this, this kind of, uh, of uh, asymptotic behavior for the, for the expectation. And um, and now there are several possible regimes, right? Uh, so, for instance, uh, and everything depends on the relation between n uh, and the, how far how fast goes r n to r n to zero as compared to n going to infinity. And uh, so, in many of these regimes, for instance, the two that I'm going to consider in in the next slide is the sparse regime, the thermodynamic regime. One has central limit theorems, and what I want to put forward. With, with this presentation is that if one studies at a functional level these central limit theorems, one can obtain functional fluctuations that distinguish in a more, in a clearer way between the different regimes. And so, and this can be done because this edge counting random variable can be very easily represented in terms of U statistics, right? So you can easily represent this um, in terms of U statistics. And so the statement is the following. So for instance, consider uh, the sparse regime. So the sparse regime is a regime where Rn goes to zero very fast. So here we consider therefore the situation which n times Rn to the power d converges to zero. Uh, then we know that the variance is commensurate to n squared Rn over d. And therefore we can take our U process, which is therefore this edge counting uh, stochastic process, we can subtract the expectation, normalize with the square root of the variance and obtain a renormalized U process, z n of t. And what can be done, but when we prove by using our results, the result was put in forward before, is that if you assume that R n of d converges to, uh, to, uh, to zero at a certain speed, that is by being a little o of one over n, and in such a way that n to the power two minus delta is a little o of R n d for some delta bigger than zero, this accounts for this condition in the theorem, that is this condition in the theorem we had here, um, then this normalized U process converges in distribution as a random function on the spherical space to a time change by Ramian motion, where the time change is t to the power two, well, because these are U statistics that you with this behind the scene are U statistics of order two. Now, you can consider other regimes. So for instance, the thermodynamic regimes tells you that uh, if you now you consider that in such the number of points and the speed of convergence of the radius uh, compensate in such a way that the n times r n to the power d converges to the number rho, uh, which is finite and non strictly positive, then we know that the variance is of an order n. And if you build now a, um, a, a renormalized u process as the one that uh, was described before, but we, we are now I'm divided by the correct order of the variance, then you have that this z prime of n process uh, converges to a linear combination of two independent Brownian motions. So one Brownian motion is time changes before as t squared, 
And the other is obtained by taking a regular Brownian motion and then multiplying, uh, multiplying this by T, right? And these are uh, multiplied by, so a linear combination with the constants alpha and beta that verify this relation and in such that in the application they are completely, uh, they're completely explicit. Okay. Um, so, uh, and one can go on, you can count, you can count, you can also consider uh, uh, other regimes like a dense regime where some additional considerations have to be taken. And uh, one can also consider arbitrary subgraph counting. You can count triangles, squares, uh, stars, uh, clicks, or whatever. And, and in any case, uh, you will obtain a result of this type, some functional convergence corresponding to linear combination of time change Brownian motion. And this gives you like some sort of a, of a, of a complete characterization of functional, uh, functional fluctuations in this, in, um, in, this, um, in this framework. Okay. So uh, what I would like to tell you also before switching quickly to the last, very last part of my talk. So how much, how much time do I have? Because we started a bit later. Okay, I admitted, uh, sorry, around maybe eight minutes. Eight minutes, perfect, perfect, very good. So let me tell you also uh, that uh, this kind of sequential U processes, and in particular, the functional convergence which are associated with sequential U processes can be motivated uh, in terms of a particular statistical application. And so the statistical application is the one that is called change point analysis. So change point analysis is a basic problem in statistics. It, it goes as follows. So you have a sample of n random variables and uh, uh, you want to test, so and you want to, so x1, xn, for instance, points in the square, as in our case, and you would like to test the null hypothesis that these random points are equally distributed, identically distributed, versus the alternative hypothesis that at a certain point, let's say, for a certain index n0, the distribution changes. So for instance, the first five points are uniformly distributed on the square, and then starting from point number six, the points are uniformly distributed on a sub-diagonal region, okay? And so, and in order to do that, to test this assumption, one uses empirical processes and actually sequential U processes, similar to the ones that I've uh, des been describing before. And so in particular, one special choice of empirical process, U processes is popular in change point analysis, is this change point empirical process of the kind that I'm describing here. So it's similar to what we did before, but it's a bit different. So it is obtained as follows. So you take a random function indexed by t in 0, 1, and at each point t, this random function counts the number of edges in your Hilbert graph, but that connects points that came before point integer part of nt and after point, uh, I mean, after the point in time integer part of nt. So you count edges that connect points that come after and before a certain, a certain point in time, so a certain point in time. So you can imagine that this can be put formally into the framework of testing procedure for, uh, for change point analysis and actually something that has been done. This is called graph-based change point detection. It comes from a paper from Chen and Zhang from 2015. So by using these techniques and so by uh, adapting in some sense, uh, or actually by uh, applying in a proper way the results of what I described before, one also can prove uh, invariance principle for these change point processes. And uh, uh, for instance, in the sparse regime, uh, these change point processes uh, renormalize and centered in a proper way and assuming that Rn of D converges to zero in a way that makes the assumptions of the, uh, of the theorem verified. So one can prove that this change point process is converging in distribution to a multiple of a Brownian bridge, which is good news because for testing procedures, one is typically uh, interested in um, the distribution of the maximum, of the arg maximum that is associated with an object of this type and maxima and arg maxima of Brownian, Brownian bridge are have a well-known distribution and therefore can be used for testing procedures. Okay. So this finishes the, uh, the, uh, uh, the symmetric case. So as I was saying, the symmetric case therefore uh, takes advantage in a very important way of the combinatorial simplifications that come from the symmetry assumption. And in such a way that the limiting, so the, the limiting objects at a functional level appear at a sort of a universal nature. It's a linear combination of time change Brownian motion multiplied by some deterministic factor and uh, so that, uh, and the, this rigid structure cannot be escaped. This is what happens at the end. 
Now, in a later work, and this is the part of my last talk, uh, well, we were interested in the, uh, uh, in the behavior of non-symmetric Hugh processes and degenerate Hugh processes. We wanted a functional version of the Young theorem in the non-symmetric case. So in that case, our starting point actually was a, a paper that we proved in 2010. I mean, our motivating point was a paper that we proved uh, with Ivan Nurnan and Gezin Reiter, and we, we wrote in 2010. And this paper contained a universality result that actually can be used to give a conceptual proof of the Young theorem. I mean, if you look at the proof by Stein's method, the Martingale method, the Young theorem, these are not conceptual proofs, are technical proofs that hide which is intuition behind that. But in the case of homogeneous sums, this was the object of my paper of 2010, one can actually prove a version of the Young theorem uh, by using some conceptual, uh, I mean, that is a, a conceptually satisfying, that gives you an intuition of what's going on behind the scenes. So in this invariance principle that we proved with, uh, with Gesin and with Ivan is the following. So now consider a sequence of homogeneous sums that are based on Gaussian entries, right? So we focus on Gaussian entries. And uh, uh, so, and in this case, uh, so this, are, as I was saying before, is the Gaussian entries are IID, M01. And then as I was saying before, these are prime examples of uh, non-symmetric degenerate use statistics, not exhaustive, but crucial examples of that. So what we prove in that paper is that now, if you assume that the fourth moment converges to three in the Gaussian case, so just in the case of Gaussian entries, then automatically you have that this guy converges to a Gaussian distribution, which is the content of the fourth moment theorem of Gaussian in a chaos, but also that the same happens for any choice of random variable xi that are independent and verify some mild uh, boundedness assumption on the moments of order two plus it's slightly bigger than slightly bigger than two. Okay, so this is a universality result, which is very much in the spirit of universality results for random matrices, for instance, uh, where you say, okay, I can I prove a result for the Gaussian setting, and then I have some universality argument that allow me to extend everything in a non-Gaussian setting. Or, and, uh, and so, and the crucial idea which is behind this result is that this phenomenon, so this phenomenon, the converge of the fourth moment in the Gaussian case to three, implies the convergence to zero of influence functions that are associated, maximal influences, that are associated with this few statistic for any choice of x. And once you have that, you can just deduce uh, the, uh, uh, the Gaussian fluctuations of these guys from the Gaussian fluctuation of this guy, because due to some deep result by Mosul, O'Donnell, and Leskiewicz, we know that influence functions can be used to measure the discrepancy between the distribution of, uh, of homogeneous sums or more generally polynomials in random variables that come from different distributions. Okay, so this is a quite a popular result actually. It has been used in mathematical physics by Caravenna, Sun and Ziguras, and in many other situations. And in particular, there is a recent and quite a spectacular application to zeros of random polynomials by Angst de Poly. It's a true universality result under minimal assumption. So our question was, so does this universality results hold at a functional level, right? And so, and this is what we what you think. So first of all, we have a version of the theorem by De Jong for degenerate sequential U processes, not necessarily, right? Not necessarily homogeneous sums in a very general setting. And, uh, and we have the following statement. So assume the following. So assume that the maximal influence of this U process at the point one converges to zero. Assume that uh, the fourth moment of this use process at the point one converges to three. So these are the two assumptions of the Young theorem already. And assume moreover uh, that uh, uh, the, the kernels verify an inequality. So this inequality does not appear in the Young theorem and even in my previous statements. Uh, so that tells you that the fourth moment of the kernels is bounded by some constant independent on the choice of the indices of n of the second moment to the power two. So this is something that goes in the opposite direction of the cauchy schwarz inequality. Then if you have this relation here, then automatically, you know that UN is relatively compact uh, in D01, in this space, the score of the space D01, and every adherent point has the law of a continuous Gaussian process, okay? So it is automatically will be a continuous Gaussian process. So there is this assumption. So one can actually remove this assumption and go straight into the framework of 
of uh, the Young theorem, but then in that case, one would have to uh, strengthen this assumption, and uh, which, which is, uh, I, we, we believe is less interesting for applications. And so I'm starting from that, we also had a result about functional universality that tells you exactly as it was before. So now consider the U process built from homogeneous sums with Gaussian entries and assume that this U process converges in D01 to a continuous Gaussian process. Then the same, the same conclusion holds for uh, the U process, which is built for every sequence of independent center random variables that verify some slightly more demanding um, moment condition. That is the expectation of Xi to the power four is finite. Um, okay, and so now to the end, what I want to tell you is that, um, so you don't have to read this statement. What I want just to tell you is that in a non-symmetric case, we can achieve limit processes that are not achievable in the symmetric case. So in particular, we can obtain as a limit uh, Brownian motion at time change by ratios of the form K over M. And of course, if this K over M is not an integer, then we will obtain something that is completely outside the scope of the previous results um, in the symmetric case. And uh, finally, my last slide is about um, something that a problem that I find interesting. So I would like to, we would like, we, we try to, to have functional versions of this, right? We would like to obtain functional versions of these results and uh, to check how much of these results depend of bounds that we would obtain in principle can be expressed in a simple way in terms of fourth moments, in terms of influence functions. And so for the moment, this has resisted our attempts um, so I was thinking for a while that we were, we were thinking for a while that this is mostly related to computational issues. Uh, the reason being that we have to consider test functions in order to make our strategy of proof work. We have to consider test function that are very regular. If we are not able by using those test function to go back uh, to the topology, which is adapted to the D01 space. Uh, so Christian and Nikolai, managed to do something like this. Uh, so in the proper in a proper setting, but uh, for use statistics, but that are related to third moment theorems. They, they actually have statements that involve third moment theorems. And there are some relevant references by Couton de Crossfond and Bourgain Cantes that try to have limit theorems for random variables that are Hilbert space or Banach space uh, valued, uh, which is not enough, of course, for convergence in the D01 space. And that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Giovanni, for a very interesting talk about these recent developments. And <clears throat> now we have some time for questions or comments. So just please unmute yourself and uh, ask your questions or just give comments. Hi, Giovanni, that was a nice talk. So I, I kind of just want, can you say a little bit more detail on like just your last slide, second to last slide. So you you were able to prove like multivariate finite dimensional results using exchangeable pairs, right? right. And right. then, right. but then there are some, you know, this result of Dobler and Kasperzak, they also have exchangeable pairs, but at the process level, right? They're sort right, of- Right, exactly, exactly. So they managed to do that. At the, at yeah, the but like typically those calculations kind of, yeah, it's like you said, it, it, there's some technical issue of pushing it but it's sort of only computationally technical to push it to the... I, I, th I think so. I was convinced that, it, I, I'm quite convinced that it's a technical limitation. Uh, that is, for the moment, we just managed to use test functions that are too regular in the sense of we, can, we, we don't have the right argument to go back to the right, um, uh, to write, to follow the right kind of test functions. In the, you mean in the functional setting? I'm sorry? You mean in the functional setting? Yeah, in a functional setting, yes, exactly. In a functional setting, the test functions you're using, I see, the, so you're able to get sort of functional looking, like bound terms that show up in the functional setting, but then those terms aren't in a strong enough like topology. Right, exactly, exactly this, exactly this. So I must say, I mean, we, 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 uh, we stopped for a bit, so maybe now um, uh, the, 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 um, the technical computation we put forward improving this last, uh, non-quantitative results might help us in some way. But for the moment, yes, that's it. We have to, to, to limit ourselves to test functions that are not strong enough in order to, uh, to obtain bounds in the right topology. Okay, okay, all right, that's interesting, thanks. Yeah. But maybe, I mean, maybe your contributions are going to work on that. 
Yeah, I mean, we have this smooth, this infinite dimensional smoothing thing. So uh, right, exactly. It might, it exactly. might that might help for sure. Exactly. Uh, I have to take a closer look. Exactly. Giovanni, I have just a question. Uh, of course, it's a little bit probably beyond your talk because uh, you, you discuss mainly Gaussian scenes. But say, uh, if you consider functional scenes, so for non-functional scenes, there are a lot of generalizations recently from Gaussian to gamma and all other cases. Do you think that it's possible to do something for non-Gaussian processes like that? Uh, for, for okay, yeah. I, I mean, even in the finite dimensional setting, um, uh, gamma limits for your statistics yes, are, uh, would be. I mean, I, 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 it is for sure an interesting problem, um, and probably there is also some uh, some example that might or the application that might motivate this. So I think I, I, I think this is possible. I think at the, at the, at the, in the finite dimensional setting, I think some for some classes of distributions. This extension is doable, and it's, um, uh, for instance, converges to a chi squares gamma or vectors of gamma, even in some form. I think this is this is for sure possible. And um, once again, um, there, there is a bit of a bump in the in the combinatorial part. Is that is that it's had it's going to be to be had in uh, some combinatorial considerations have to be done. But I think it, it, it is possible, and I believe that. Uh, uh, that it should have a form of a, a simple statement. So, for instance, in the for convergence to gamma, we have to control some something that involves not only the fourth moment but also some other moments. And so, I think I think this this could happen quite uh, quite easily. Yeah. I mean, and also one has to say that um, there is a. I mean, if you if you consider your statistics of a fixed order that are degenerate. And you just look at that without letting the kernel uh, uh, depend on the sample size. So it's something I should have said maybe more clearly. Uh, then the natural limit, if they use statistic as an order, which is not one, the natural limit is exactly non-Gaussian. So these are famous results uh, that tell you that it converts to elements of the second linear chaos, third linear chaos, fourth linear chaos. This is a paper by Dinkin and Mandelbaum that does that, I think, and then several expansions on this, on this result. So uh, actually, for your statistic of a non, uh, for the particularly bigger than one, the Gaussian case is the exception. So we force a structure which is non natural. And then the natural fluctuation would be non Gaussian. Uh, but then, of course, it's, it's interesting to quantify this and, it's, and to, uh, to target some specific elements, some non Gaussian elements for any order of the your statistics. So it's a very interesting problem indeed. That's okay. Uh -huh. Any other comments or questions, please? Okay, if not, uh, let us thank Giovanni again. So for very interesting talk and slides are available on the site of Probability Victoria Seminar. So you can download and probably if you are interested to contact Giovanni about that.